Welcome to week two. It's time to talk strategy, tactics, and some of the applications of those frameworks and theories you might have encountered in intro, or you might have seen you know, over in strategy, where you're thinking, well, when would I ever actually use a SWOT analysis in my life? So, we're tracking towards the first of the major assessment outcomes, and that's the e-technology analysis. As part of that project, what I'm going to ask you to do is set some goals and set a roadmap and do a Gantt chart and then go off and implement those particular frameworks. So what you're going to want to do is think through your overarching strategy for your project, then break it down to a series of tactical outcomes that you can implement in that period between the ETA going live and the portfolio being due. Because remember, the ETA runs for longer than the e-performance review. Now one of the things with regards to strategy, tactics, and or well, actually optimizations in general, is it's really important to be pragmatic about the value you're getting from what you're doing. Now one of the challenges that we encounter in e-marketing on a regular basis is the idea that people have of technology being more efficient therefore somehow we'll save you know, we'll save money, we'll save time, we'll save whatever. It's usually the opposite way around. We usually end up spending more time than we do uh, saving because it's another behavior and it's another activity and it comes with its own requirements. So. Be mindful, be calculative, and work out what's the best when you're putting something together. And even if you're looking at something like, I'm asking you to use bullet journals as tracking tools, as efficiency tools, as planning tools. But if you're going to spend more time on your bullet journal than on the activities you're journaling, you're not getting the benefit. The other challenge that you're going to encounter is you will be needing to make decisions. Decisions that will have consequences and consequences that you will then act upon. For some people, the need to pick between strategy A and strategy B is going to bring about the analysis by paralysis moment of trying to work out, yes, but if this, then that, what? Sometimes you just got to grab one, scenario it, test run it, and if it's working okay, keep going. Don't worry about necessarily finding the best, the singular one truth. Try something out, make it an experiment, make it a feature that maybe it's not the most efficient, it's just the one you're running with at the moment. And you're gonna to need to make these decisions because you're going to be doing a practical, pragmatic exercise of implementing a plan very, very shortly. So, as I mentioned before, the fundamental ideal behind strategy is that you make a decision. And that decision then creates a cascade effect. Actually, it creates a cascade effect of narrowing things down. I will ask you to pick a target market as your starting point so that you can focus your effort and energy into a single offer for a single target market. Once you've made that decision, that decision should then inform the next series of outcomes. So when I talk about decisions that require consequences, if you've made a decision but you can't see anything different about what happens next, you probably haven't actually made a decision. If you are trying to create a product, you want to launch an Instagram account and you've decided that you want it to be the account that is everything for everyone, that's not a decision. If you've got a choice between three audiences and you're still trying to address all three audiences, well, one of them gets addressed first, and that's a decision. So strategy means set up your options, calculate your options, enact one of them, enable one of them, and let that help you make the rest of the, th the, rest of the project easier. Because the final thing about the decisions requiring consequences is consequences are 
good and consequences are neutral and consequences could be bad. But basically a consequence is the outcome of a decision. It has no positive or negative connotation. But if you can't see a difference from a decision, you haven't made a decision. Alright, let's talk a couple of uh, broad strategic philosophies. First of all, the, a couple of the matrices that you're going to see here, the G finance matrix and the Ansoff matrix, they're old tech. They are robust descriptors of what could be. They are not necessarily scientifically, mathematically proven models that you can go and throw through a calculator. They're ways to conceptualize and think about the world. They're starting points. I am a particular fan of the GE Finance Matrix because it has three strategic choices. Withdrawal, maintenance, and growth. The Ansoff Matrix, which we will also talk about, has one choice, and that choice is growth. So the Ansoff Matrix is the Ansoff Growth Matrix, not necessarily a strategy matrix overall. Now, you'll find the GE Finance Matrix makes a bit of a comeback uh, at several points during semester. I find it to be a useful thing because it operates on a 3x3, three three, low, medium, and high, and often it can be done in terms of either capacity or strength, or it's an evaluative tool out of the back of something like a SWOT analysis or a SWOT report. Where do I have an opportunity? And from that opportunity, where is the strength? What do I get back from applying that strength to that opportunity? So here you've got nine possible choices of direction to take. This works really well once you have a product offer, once you've experienced the delivery, once you've been doing things for a while, because you'll then have a calculation about the returns. It's also useful from a front end, you can make assumptions about the type of return you could expect. But functionally, what you're looking at here is either it's something you want to do more of, something you want to maintain, or something you want to get out of, or change. Just a, a note as well that you can change your strength, but it might be challenging to change the returns. All right, let's go play with the Ansoff matrix for a bit because it's the Ansoff matrix and it has a really good set of uses in social media and internet marketing. So the first thing, if you're not familiar with the Ansoff matrix, here it is. It's a two by two matrix of two fundamental questions. Do you have a value offer? And do you have an audience that you're currently distributing that value offer to? If you answer yes, yes I have a value offer, then your choice of growth is I will provide more of this value offer to the people I am currently servicing with it, or I will provide more of this value offer to people I am not currently servicing with it. So this is why your question is, do I have a market? Will I have a new market? If you're in a position that you have a market and you have a new product for that market, it's product development. If you have a market and you have a current product and you want to sell more of it, it's market penetration. If you have a current product that you want to introduce to a new market, market development. If you have neither product nor market and you're just starting out, it's diversification. Equally, you might find a pivot moment where you go, I have a capacity to create a new thing, and I think I can get a new audience for that value offer. I'm going to crack open diversification. All four of these strategies have their relative merits and advantages and disadvantages. There is not a default superior choice. Diversification is one of the hardest because it combines the worst of both worlds People don't know who you are and they don't know about your product. So you are at the very, very bottom of the innovation adoption curve and innovation adoption cycle. Market penetration, on the other hand, is 
people already have some experience with you and your value offer, people are already consuming it, your challenge there is that they may not want more of it. You may not be able to get market penetration because you might have saturation. So let's just quickly run through a couple of combinations of how the answer growth matrix would work based on some assumptions about your project. So for the ETA, if you're going to start from scratch, a new social media account, a new project, hitherto never run it before, welcome to diversification. When you sign up and create that new Instagram account, that's diversification. If you have a current audience that you can go and point and say, hey, come over and follow my new account, that's a different story. This is where you've got no audience, ex no existing audience, no existing content. You're going to start up from scratch. It is where a lot of projects in this semester will find themselves. So keep that in mind. If you have an existing social media project, you can work with it. It's completely fair to take something you're already doing and use it as a basis for the ETA. Which, if you already have a project, welcome to your choice. You can have more, people consume more of your project, or you can try and bring that project to a new audience. Now, as a quick note, uh, market penetration is pretty much what we try and do with this. Uh, with the content is market penetration here on the subject, but market development is what we do for enrollments. We want, we very rarely have people do this subject twice. Uh, particularly, there's no point where I think anyone's ever gone, you know what, I'd like to come back and do e-marketing again so I can run a second project. I don't think that's ever happened, so we've never had an effective market penetration strategy. We can't sell you more of the subject you've already studied and graduated from. But what we can do is, since we already exist, and this course has been running for a while, and you know, it ran last year, I was able to look at a new product development avenue of creating the Shadow Hawker self-service courses. I knew I was going to have an audience of existing students. I had a value offer that was pre-existing. I thought I could make a new value offer to make it more valuable, make the course slightly different. So if you are running and you have been in existence for a while, you always have choices. So if you're looking at something like an Instagram account, you can create more content. So you've got a weekly posting schedule of Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday. You could up that to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Or you could go, I've got an Instagram account. I've got an Instagram audience. Hey, follow me on Twitch. We're going to do some live streams on Wednesdays. Tuesday, Thursday, content updates for the Instagram, Wednesdays for the Twitch, you're bringing your audience to a new product. You as the personal brand still exist. And the market development is also where you go and try and encourage more people. So you collaborate, maybe you collaborate with another team and try and bring some of their fans across, or you try and increase your numbers of more people following you. All of these are ways in which you can work if you've got some content, you've got some product, you've got a value offer behind you and you've, been, you've got an audience that you've been engaged with. As I mentioned, the market saturation might be a challenge for you that you've got the maximum out of that particular audience. They are getting value, adding new things in does not increase their value. So you can't get them to like the video twice. You can't get them to like the Instagram photo twice. You're maxing out their capacity. In which case, if you want to grow, you then have to look to new audiences or new offers. And the last one is diversification because you're bored. Uh, it is a business strategy. Microsoft has done it more than a few times. But it's this idea that you go and have a new, an innovation breaks out in your operation. 
uh, possibly new to world or new to us or new to market. Most likely a new to market or a new to world where you diversify out and go, I'm going to address an audience I haven't dealt with previously. Which of course comes with all the challenges of you're exactly in the same boat of I'm starting up, I'm starting from scratch. Because if you're bringing an audience across, it is a new product for an existing audience. If you're taking something that already exists across to people who you have previously serviced or something you've already got that you're bringing to a new market, you're out of diversification. So it's there as an option. It is also how uh, it's the pivot moment for a lot of organizations. All right, let's look at a couple of generic strategies. This is the Porter product oriented generic strategy. These are going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about their adaptations and how I can see them applying in e-marketing and in, particularly in the context of running something like the ETA. Most likely product differentiation and niche marketing will be your two favored choices of the three. Cost leadership is probably better if you have an existing project uh, and you are competing in a market. So let's start with the first one, product differentiation. This is about being, about focusing on relative advantage, about being differently useful, and that 1% extra value, slightly more valuable, slightly more useful. It's really got to be customer centric. You've got a lot of co-creation opportunity here. Uh, you might find this around something like if you're running a Twitch stream or a link, <laughs> about to say LinkedIn stream. <laughs> if you're live streaming uh, and you're using a platform like Twitch and you're live streaming video games, now there are a lot of games being played by a lot of people. What you might find is your particular personality, um, the way you project yourself through your gaming or whatever, uh, could be that product differentiation. It's bringing the personal, the parasocial connection, the who you are, yourself as the authentic self as the value offer. Uh, so that could be the different and useful. Key thing is differentiation is where there's competition in the market. You are very much thinking about your positioning. That means you're thinking about your targets and your segmentation. So. Uh, Competition is always useful. Competition is your friend and your ally. It lets you it lets you position and draw on what they're doing to say, well, I'm like services marketing but digital. And I sit between services marketing and brand strategy. Uh, positioning counts. A couple of the other things on the uh, product differentiation for you. As if you go down the social media path of being the persona and the value comes from the personality, you are providing subjective experience. Some people will like you more than other people like you. What you are creating through your subjective difference is perhaps allegiance in group, fandom. You have followers, you have people who are willing to support you they create a community identity. There's a lot of stuff, and we'll pick up some of this in uh, commu the community lecture later in the semester. But functionally, subjective differentiation is in the eye of the consumer. Objective differentiation is where you can point to something specific. Now, I come back in the marketing space to exclusivity and restricted downloadable content. If you have a, you're a musician and you only release your music through Bandcamp, then you've got platform exclusivity. You know, you play a little snippet of it on your Instagram channel and you play a little snippet of it on your YouTube vlog, but you say, hey, to get my content, subscribe to Spotify, exclusively available on Spotify. That is differentiation. Same way, um, an exclusive feature. So something like a platform exclusive, uh, 
you know, this is only available on PlayStation 5, which means it's not available to very many people. All of the objective things are elements that you have greater control over, but they may not necessarily be the points of value for your customer. Same time, subjectivity is harder to enable and harder to implement, but they are the points of greatest value and value co-creation with your customer. So when you're putting together your social media presence or you're thinking about your e-portfolio, you're thinking about your, uh, in fact, in your e-portfolio, product differentiation is part of what I'm getting you to do. I am asking you to reflect back on your authentic personal experience. So you are creating for me an e-portfolio that is subjective about your unique experience. So effectively, you're doing product differentiation training whilst you're creating your e-portfolio. All right, cost leadership. Now this one, this is difficult, but doable. Uh, if you have an existing social media presence, I think this could be a very interesting way to do things. The aim here is that you want to create your content faster, cheaper, quicker, or better than the people who you're rivaling against. Now, I think I could make a case to say that I, in my e-marketing subject, I am using cost leadership by pre-recording my content, blitz pre-recording in the pre-semester. I am creating a, I'm doing this cheaper and faster than my colleagues who perhaps are doing it live over a number of days. Now, if you're going to go into a video-based or audio-based production, your capacity to do one shots. Now this is something I'm going to tell you now, I have trained for an extended number of years. I have been doing media training, I've been doing video training, I have been creating these content pieces. One shotting a continuous dynamic all the way through. This is a 45 minute lecture normally. If I can deliver it one time, 45 minutes straight through, no cuts, no edits, no breaks, then that's cost leadership over someone who takes an hour to produce it and then has to edit back to 45 minutes. It means I'm doing it cheaper for me. So that's what cost leadership is about. It's about your production side. It is not about price leadership. And this is really important. If we are able to now, something like Kickstarter. You go to Kickstarter and you put up a project because you want to make a, you've got an idea, you want to make some custom dice, some custom manufactured dice that, because there's a big demand for role playing games at the moment, you want to make some custom manufactured dice. If you can get 10,000 backers, then you can produce those dice at a volume that makes them cheaper than your competitor. So when you sell a unit at uh, $25 for a pack of D&D uh, &D 5 edition dice, and you're producing them for $10, if your neighboring competitor is producing them for $15, you are winning on cost leadership if you're both charging the same price. Don't use cost leadership as a way to automatically try and knock your price down. Just don't do it. It's not what the point of the strategy is. In e-marketing, and particularly in something like the projects you likely do with the ETA, cost leadership here is about faster, quicker, more effective ways to get your content produced, created, and out into the queues or out to your audience than your rivals. Again, case in point, one of the channels that I follow, uh, Colin Furs, a YouTuber from the UK who's a, an engineer. He has a project that is currently being uh, broadcast at the time of recording on his channel that took him 18 months to record. Compare that to one of my other channels I follow, this, you know, and you'll 
get to see a lot of them. The Stora Parkour team, who produce content every Monday, so they are looking at creating enough video content in a week to try and get content out. Compared to another um, parkour athlete, Dom Tomato, who in the same time has produced enough content to run three weeks ahead of schedule. So all of these video, they're all in the same market. They are all video producers, vloggers, creating content for YouTube. One of them can do this content at pace, cheaper, faster, and quicker so they can produce more of it and have a buffer zone between themselves and the next time they run out of content. Beating, beat the market, beat your opponents, be faster, better, quicker in your production side. Now, flipping to the other side, niche marketing. Now, look, I think if you are starting a project for this semester, if you're going to go, all right, I'm going to have a crack at this, yeah, you crack and open a Depop store, you run a, a new fresh Instagram, you're doing a fresh install of Twitch, whatever your play is, niche is your strength. Look at who you are as the authentic self. Who are you? What is the value proposition someone has for following you? Focus on that, then find the audience that wants what you've got. And this is what niche is about. It is a, it's a brilliant starting point because innovation adoption theory, two and a half percent of the market are innovators. That instant niche. You bring something new and shiny to the marketplace, the innovators who are two and a half percent of any given market are going to go, ooh, I, hey, shiny thing, I want. And you've got your start. Thing about this is you don't necessarily have to grow out of a niche. A niche can be sustainable and it can be all you need. Uh, it, again, case in point, and when we get into the whole internet aspect, is there's a lot of independent games being produced. The whole indie games market on Steam is massive. It may not be, you may not need also as your personal goal is that you want to create a, you, know, you have a hobby. You know. One of the things is that I uh, follow a number of specialist hobby photographers on my Instagram and they don't need mass market appeal. Uh, if you're into a particular genre of music, you could blog about that music. You could talk about your, you could track down this music and listen to the stuff from SoundCloud and then blog about it, uh, run a WordPress account about it, run a Twitter updates, all of which are just focused around the one core value offer of you expressing your opinion and your expertise about a tiny slice of audio preference that you and a few dozen other people share. But by doing this, you're getting huge value for yourself because you are producing content that you want to hear, see, or do, stuff that you're into and you're interested in. You're using the prosumer model and you're talking to a bunch of people who are like-minded who also want to hear what you've got to say because they're into the same stuff. Brilliant way to get yourself, like, again, marketing is all about segmentation. Niche marketing for e-marketing is just a brilliant way to start a project because what you might find is what you thought was a small audience of stuff that you were excited about Take it from me as someone who has been playing Dungeons and Dragons since the 1980s. The widespread, massive spread of people who are totally into role playing games now. This is a niche that grew as people found value as they encountered the niche, as the gatekeepers were eliminated and the product spread. But there are so many like niche ways in which role playing games can be done the value proposition that's out there now can find you can find the audience 
who wants to hear from you. So totally get into this as you, I think this is you, if you go on diversification, do diversification to niche as your kickoff if you're starting from scratch. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about three platforms where I've got examples and a fourth platform that I do not have an example for. I'll talk about Patreon first. Patreon, uh, which I always pronounce in weird ways, is a payment platform that allows you to create niche product that you then restrict directly to an audience. Brilliant, brilliant platform. Uh, okay, brilliant concept of a platform. They took third round funding from one of those nasty um, US based venture capital funds that goes and kicks out anybody who happens to be either queer, a sex worker, or actually interesting person who created the value for the goddamn site to start with. See also OnlyFans deciding it's going to pivot away into not covering the content that made it worth having a market cap in the first place. But this is, so one thing I will say is your danger with the niche market is your market provider, your platform provider might decide that you are not a market they want to service anymore because they are using you to get into the product life cycle. They want you to get over that first hurdle. They want you to be the innovators that attract the early adopters and then they're going to pivot to boot you out to focus on their late majority, early majority. Watch for that. That's a risk. <sighs> Rant over. Patreon, though, its purpose is once you have an audience, you can monetize that audience by giving exclusivity through the Patreon distribution channel. To get to that audience, three of the platforms I want to talk about Etsy is a physical goods platform, SoundCloud is an audio digital goods platform, and eBay is eBay. Within Etsy, uh, there are a lot of subcategorizations. So I was only able to get a uh, quick note. These, I don't, these steps here, this is referred to as a breadcrumb, breadcrumb trial. So when I talk about breadcrumbs, that's what I mean, the, each step down the line. Best breadcrumb I was able to pull off on Etsy was around four deep. Um, I think you'd probably go five or six. But it's about, now here in art, this is about the medium. You can search, keyword search, to find your niche. But if you're also going, look, I, I'm totally into this art made with spray paint cans. You, know, you see the people out there uh, with their spray paint cans, their respiros on, their little pieces of paper, creating amazing uh, future sci-fi images by well, basically everything they're doing there. Four deep, that's Etsy, but keyword searching. So if you're totally into um, basically esoteric uh, Xenoplanet work, there it is, it's there for you. Your second one, SoundCloud. Now this is, SoundCloud's one of my uh, favorite platforms. I have been a music producer in my past and I think I've got most of my content up on SoundCloud at the moment. So for my challenge for this was I went and asked, I, I thought, what's the silliest thing I could possibly do? I know I'm going to put the keyword meow into SoundCloud to see if anyone has been making music sampling their cat. Not only was there an entire series, uh, although it was really big about five years ago. So there was, there's also a product life cycle. There was a fashion phase. It's a niche. Uh, it's totally niche to have uh, people doing uh, performances with their cat and now I realize I've got a link to another cat video for you later. But basically, the thing with SoundCloud is SoundCloud has encountered a few problems. Uh, it was very, very good at niche uh, through hashtag. So you'll see that the hashtag meow is still present. Uh, 
what's missing at the moment here is you don't have the breadcrumbs. You can't really like you see this tracking. It's like, well, what's track? What are tracks like? It, it's harder to find, uh, and that's partly databasing issues. And music is harder to classify and categorize than other elements. Now, this is my favorite, and it's my favorite for two reasons. This is one of the best niche examples I can think of. So, from the top. First of all, the depth that we were able to get on eBay in terms of breadcrumbs, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven levels deep of classification. What we have on screen is miniature figures to go onto a Z gauge model railway from a specific company that makes these particular product. So we are talking about a niche product in the overall hobby industry, model trains, subcategorized into a range of different gauges, of which Z scale is the smallest, of which for the Z scale you have a broad category of track, train, scenery, stuff, parts and accessories. Within parts and accessories, you subcategorize again, as you can see, the range of options down the side here. Within that subcategory is a subcategory for a brand. This is niche. Also, the other reason I'm totally excited by this is when I was a yay high as a child, my parents used to make Z-Gage Railway stuff, so uh, chance to bring an old flashback from my childhood into my current. But this is how I knew about it as well, is that it's a completely, it's a niche that you may not have anyone you come across. Uh, I don't actually know anyone I would be able to personally talk to outside my family who would care about this, but I can search for it and I can find both materials to buy on eBay and then if I start throwing these keywords into Google, I will find my community. I will find my niche. I will be able to be a customer in an audience of something that I care about. So this is totally awesome. Uh, this is why the internet, this is the absolute powerhouse of the internet, is the self-categorized, niche identifying, niche finding. It's also the antithesis of the algorithm averaging protocol that your Facebooks uh, are trying to implement. And Facebook's trying to implement it because Facebook scales better than it subcategorizes. Which is dumb, and it should be the other way around, but at the moment Facebook optimized for volume, where they started they were very good at niche. So it's all about making certain you got the right technology in play. Okay, let's talk briefly about objectives and goals. These are important. They are going to determine how much fun you have in implementing your project. When you write the e-technology analysis, you will set goals. You will set objectives, you're going to produce a Gantt chart, you're going to do a timeline. I will give you feedback on that, I will support you, I will help you get a really good set of goals that are clear, attainable, and will drive your subject experience. Because SMART is a mantra rather than a checklist. I say this because what you want to be able to do is have a goal that is clear, precise, concise, and you know when it will be achieved by and what steps you need to do to achieve it. With this, so the reason why we use SMART as a framework is specific. You need to know what it is you want to do. And if you say, look, oh, I want to get an HD in the subject. Okay, how? What, what, what steps are you going to take? What it, it fails at actionable. You can't guarantee it. You can't say it uh, because you can't break it down. But if you say, what I want to do is I want to create a niche hobby focused Instagram account that lets me share my love of Z Gage Railway with the world over the next 12 weeks. 
it's got goals, it's got actionable. How's it going to happen? We can tell. Timetable, 12 weeks. Realistic, you're totally into something, you want to photograph it and you want to put it up on your Insta. Sweet. That's doable. So smart, again, think of it as a mantra rather than a thing where you have to go, oh, my goal is create video content for e-marketing, oh, specific, um, measurable. That makes it harder to do. Think about it as a holistic. Think about it as, is this statement I'm going to make, I'd like to have all the material, all the content slides recorded for the start of the semester. That gives me a goal, timeline, and I know that I've got 18 videos to record. Second thing I want to bring your attention to, uh, the internal analysis process. This is something where I'm not going to talk you through each of the steps. I want you to be conscious that you're going to use tools and techniques on yourself that you may have previously trained to think about as organizational, business, or industry tools. Two places I want you to be mindful, your resources. I am one of four subjects. If you're doing a full-time study load, I'm one of four subjects. Resource up with the assumption the other four sub the other three subjects in your life will also have demands on you. Stakeholders, the other lecturers, the other group assignments, the other subjects, they are stakeholders to your process here. You need to be mindful of that, thinking about that. Resources in terms of money, time, effort, capabilities in terms of your skills and your preferences. Now, I'm totally about the video. I absolutely love creating videos. Uh, I've got a copy of Adobe Premiere and I own six cameras, uh, so I can do three camera shoots. I can edit those three camera shoots. I've got the resources. I've got the capabilities. So I can create this content seamlessly for me, because, and I decided to do all of this because I ran the internal checklist and went, I've got the tools, I've got the capacity, and I'm going to enjoy doing it, so I've got the motivation. I'll give this a shot. Had at any point in time in any of those three boxes, I'd been like, yeah, I've got the cameras, but I don't like being on screen. Then I would have brought in another player. I would have got somebody to be my voice. Okay, external analysis. I'm going to mention this because it's super valuable. I cannot begin to tell you how important it is as a marketer to be comfortable with having competitors, to like having competitors, and to know how to reverse engineer what they're doing in order to compare your activity with theirs. You don't necessarily have to steal from them, but you do have to be mindful of, well, if we're addressing the same group of people, what's my value proposition compared to yours, and how do they work together? How are they complementary? Uh, one of the things that's impressed me about the parkour community in the United Kingdom is the level of crossover between the groups because they are all competing for the same audience, notionally. But instead of going and down trash-talking each other and down-talking each other, they are lifting each other up on the assumption of, if I'm the Motus Project and I can get fans of Stora to come and watch my blog, they're fans of parkour, therefore they that's two parkour things they can be experiencing. So whilst the Motus and Stora are competitors, they can cross over and collaborate because they are operating inside a, the same larger market and growing the size of the market lifts all players. So it's the rising tide attack. Think about that. Also think in terms of this semester, look around on the forums, you might find that notionally you have a competitor and one of the other students in the subject, but you also then have an ally and you have someone who you can trade with, work against, work with, collaborate. Competitors help. Now that's the only, uh, all the analysis, absolutely every one of the analysis things you're going to run, an analysis 
produces data, data is not knowledge. What you want to be able to do is to take your assessment of external factors and internal factors, look at what your goals, objectives and overarching game plan is and bring them together. Then to be able to go, since I want to achieve a certain outcome, where does my strength lie in pursuing this? What are the challenges, threats in pursuing this? What are the opportunities in pursuing this goal? What are the weaknesses I might have to counter? So for e-marketing, for this subject, my internal analysis, I like recording things, I'm good with digital and remote, and I'm a complete geek who gets super overexcited about technology and websites and things that many other people don't get, don't even notice. Strength, content. I know the place, I know that I love talking about it, I get excited about it. I like cameras and videos and I love the sound of my own voice. So not only can I record my own videos, I can watch them back and edit them without wincing. I think I'm fabulous, frankly. Weaknesses. I talk a lot. I get super excited and talk really fast. I need to tone. I know that I have a risk of going long when I can tone it back. Threats. A change in the dynamic of the university and the assumption that, okay, we don't want to do anything online ever again because, oh no, that was terrible. And I get banned from using online videos for the third time in my career. Opportunities. We could go bigger than this. Um, at the moment, we have a live interactive session. We have a uh, pre-recorded materials, pre-recorded things. Maybe we create an internship program. Maybe we create a second e-marketing subject that you do this as your primary, then you do an internship, do a summer project into a semester-long internship of running a course. We could expand from where we are. But all of this comes from the analysis being turned into a report and the report being turned into actionable steps. So your ETA is not a SWOT analysis. It is a technology analysis that will give goals, plans, metrics, and that is the use of the data and the use of the knowledge from a SWOT report. All right, the final model I want to bring to your attention. This is the SAMIA model. It's designed for assessing technology for education. What's really interesting about this is the four steps map back quite well to our innovation models and substitution is continuous. It's the technology swaps in, does something. Uh, it's where you swap a keyboard for uh, you know, an on-screen keyboard for an off-screen keyboard, a notepad for an iPad. You don't change the behavior, you change the technology. So instead of rocking up with a little piece of paper and a pen, you rock up with digital ink, e-ink. The augmentation is where there is, we swap this out and what we bring in its place gives us a new behavior. So it's a discontinuous innovation. We show up to a classroom with an iPad replacing the notepad, but because the iPad is wired into the network, we can then broadcast, we can flick content from our devices to screens. The Zoom lecture, which allows me to hand out a digital file that you can then hand back to me, that you can then share amongst each other, that is a functional improvement over what we were doing previously. Now we have the paper handout has a dynamic interactive component that also is much easier to share and move around. The modification. Now, video lectures are an augmentation. Self-service internships done through 
an online subject that you also then engage in an online behavior and do online things, that's getting up to, this was a significant task redesign. I got to rebuild a course that had previously been taught in lecture halls, where I'd previously been put into tutorial rooms that didn't have Wi-Fi coverage to talk about the internet. I was able to modify. And I'm old. I taught using overhead transparencies in the days before we had learning management systems. The website allowed for the creation of a new task. We could turn our events that were bounded to a box at a time and a place, and we could put them on the internet. And that was a major, the ramifications we're still feeling, but we were able to redefine the process of learning and engaging in university. We were able to make it more accessible. It created new tasks, it created new things we could do. The previously, if you wanted to know about the assignment, you had to come to lecture number one. You missed lecture number one, that was it. Best of luck, buddy. You were asking a friend. Whereas now I can record a video explaining the assignment. You can watch it. If you've got questions, you can ask me. It changed the dynamic. We created new behaviors. We created new opportunities. Most of the time, most of the technology, particularly through this semester, during your ETA and during your experience of the semester, most of your time you will be looking at substitution or augmentation because that's most of what happens in life. And it's awesome. Occasionally you'll get to play with the transformative modification where you can just really reconceptualize and rethink something. Very rarely you get to have to deal with a redefinition because those things are often very painfully disruptive and chaos inducing. Uh, COVID is, let's be blunt about this, COVID is a redefinition of society uh, and we're seeing how much fun that is. So, the SAMO model, it's a thing I'd like you to have a look at. Uh, I'd like you to have it available to you as a means by which you can filter the experiences you're about to have during the semester. You might find it useful for your ePortfolio, you might find it useful for just your general practice as you go through the semester. Uh, final thing, I just want to mention on the way past, the PESTLE analysis exists. It's an old friend. Its value is in what you do with the data from it. Now we will spend a lot of our time playing in the technological area, but that basically links to economic and social. If your intent for this semester with the ETA is to produce a project that can help you get a job, then that's going to tie technology and economic. Also, if you're going to play with social media, you need to be aware of legal. If you're going to engage in community activities and community-oriented outcomes, social will come in handy. Depending on where you're based around the world and where you plan on distributing your content, political might also be an issue. Play with the model. Explore it. It's an old familiar friend. I'm not going to walk you through it. I'm going to ask you to go play with it and take the elements that are valuable and use those to inform decisions that you make. It is an information gathering tool. And finally, the last thing I want to bring up, uh, each week from here on in, I'm going to raise a theory. I'm going to mention a framework from a paper. Now, why I want to do this is quite straightforward for me. I want to make your course easier. And to do that, I want to introduce you to the value the value and use co-creation opportunity that the journal articles, the literature, things out of Google Scholar create for you. Each week has a paper that I have set, I've read, looked at and gone, this is an idea I can take from it. Throughout the course of this video, you would have heard me talking about the Ansoff matrix. That's a theory. The GE Finance Matrix, theory. PESTOR, theory. SAMA, theory. All of these are mechanisms to make life 
easier, their ways to think about the world, their explanations and their justifications. So what we want to achieve, so we're going to start with this first paper. Now I've brought this paper into effect because it's talking about entrepreneurial orientation. And if you are setting up a new project for this semester, congratulations, you're an entrepreneur. If you are expanding upon what you're already doing and doing it in a different way, that's entrepreneurial activity. Welcome. So, with a paper like this, it lets you do multiple things. You can find value in a range of different ways. You don't have to use the totality of the paper. You only need one idea from the paper to be influencing you for the paper to have created value. Now you might find that you read the paper, read a paper, that there's a definition in there that's really useful. Now I've got an understanding of a key term or a key idea. You might find that there is the paper talks about this broad set of principles that you can then go, well, I'd like to apply those, I'd like to test that in my practice, or that's a good explanation for what I want to achieve. I've got a justification for what I'm doing. And the presence of research, like this is the opportunity to go from, oh, I, I've got to create an idea from scratch, which is really hard, to I can build upon the knowledge of others. I can turn their idea into an enhanced version of my idea, and that's dynamically continuous if it changes behavior, or continuous if it just makes your idea better. It's all about the ease and the access. So for this particular paper, they talk. there's a lot of stuff that takes place in here. There's an amazing method section. If you're doing the market research subject, this, oh, this method section. Magnificent. But that's not, not relevant to us. Doesn't matter. What matters is that they went out and measured in their environment, in the audience, for the target audiences they went for, they went and looked at and said, what are the three Porter's generic strategies which are, have been most effective for the individuals involved? And for their respondents, Differentiation was the most important method. Not niche, not focus, focus, niche. That was third of the three. Cost leadership was second. Differentiation was first. That's why I presented the theories in the order I presented them in the video. What you can do with this paper, what you'll be able to do with this is when you are setting a, your, looking at, okay, I've got an existing project. Uh, I've got my LinkedIn. I want to make myself attractive in the marketplace on LinkedIn. I want to differentiate myself. Hey, differentiation strategy, that's that's a good solid strategy and that's widely respected. I could use this paper as my justification of I want to implement a differentiation strategy to reposition, to create some clearance between myself and my uh, rivals in the market for employment as a social media analyst. Anwar and Shah, 2021. That's it, one idea. You just need the idea that works for you. Or you could read this paper and go, look, I know differentiation, but geez, I love what they said about focus, and that's really interesting. Huh? I'd like to give that a shot. I'd like to try that. It becomes a springboard. Now, over the course of this semester, one of the things I want you to do is I want you to get familiar and comfortable and up to enjoying Google Scholar. Again, we talk to, we tell you use the literature, we tell you citations, support your arguments with citations, calls the literature. Here's how. First of all, make certain you have the ANU VPN, the Global Protect VPN. It's available from the ANU's website. Uh, I always have to search ANU VPN whenever I need to reinstall it. I can never find it. Uh, I can never find anything on that site without Googling it. If you're on campus and you're in the ANU IP range, it's the equivalent. But when you're off campus, as I am, you want to be using the VPN, as I do, to be able to have your computer look like it's part of the ANU. When it is, and you go to Google Scholar, and you search for keywords, 
If we have a subscription to that journal, you get access to that PDF. And those PDFs are worth about 35 euro each, so that's about $50 a go. So that's a way to pay off your student, get more value from your student fees than you got than you've paid out. Second thing is the ideas in there are always useful. Uh, what you want to do is you want to grab these ideas. You want to remember that value and ownership is having the PDF saved to your hard drive. Value and use is reading and using the idea. Third thing is you want to go into Google Scholar with an exploratory mindset. You want to be able to look for, so you, with the ETA, don't just look up e-marketing, look up the marketing strategy that you want to use. So if you want to do growth strategy, look up growth strategies. If you want to do Instagram, look up Instagram. Look up Instagram strategy, look up search, find what's written. Multi-thousand dollars worth of articles are available for you. And your average paper costs about, production-wise, somewhere to the tune of three to five thousand dollars per paper to produce for a cheap one. Realistically, the last paper I had published, we would have input in terms of salaries, on costs, direct costs and funding. My last paper cost around fifty thousand dollars to produce and it's available to you for free. So make use of these assets, get in there, read the papers, each week we're going to talk through one of the papers. I'm going to showcase how to just get a co-production, get a co-creation, how to get an idea out of a paper and use it and bring it into effect. So with that in mind, get out there and get on with it. Go have, go play around with the internet. Go look at the ETA, what you want to do, what your strategies are, how you want to do it. If you need some clarifications, if you're looking for some support, I'm on the socials, I'm on the email, Waddle's got ways to reach out to me. And above all else, get in there and give things a try. Just crack out that innovativeness, make it happen for you. And uh, see you next time.